day of the workshop. And uh, today we have uh, for the first talk, Negin Golrezai from MIT. And uh, I have been following Negin's work for the last few years and she's a very, very productive researcher, very uh, beautiful work. So we'll see her talk today on optimal learning for structured values. Thank you very much. So, uh, Thank you very much, Shipra, for the nice introduction. And, uh, and uh, thank you everyone for coming to my talk. It's a pleasure to be here. I actually, I was here uh, last spring and I had a lot of fun actually. So it, it feels great to be back. Uh, okay, so can you guys hear me okay? Yes. Perfect. So today I'm gonna to talk about optimal learning for structured bandits. And this is a joint board with my uh, great colleague and co-author, Bart Van Paris from MIT. So, uh, uh, feel free to stop me at any point if you have any questions and comments. They are uh, absolutely more than welcome. Okay, so perhaps for this crowd, I don't really need to uh, kind of define what multi bandits are. So you all know that this is a very great for, uh, framework for online decision making under uncertainty, and there is this fundamental trade-off that uh, we face, which is exploration and exploitation. Uh, during exploration, we need to make sure that we collect information to discover the best arm. And during exploitation, we want to make sure that we exploit the collected information to go with the arm that seems the best. And the nice thing about this multi arm bandit is that you can apply it to various settings. So think about healthcare. So as a physician, if you don't know which drug is going to give you, uh, is, is going to be the most effective, you can just uh, apply this framework to identify the best drug. In revenue management, if you don't know which price you want to post, again, like you can use this framework to experiment with different prices and identify the one that maximizes your revenue. And in online advertising, if you don't know which ad is going to give you the highest click through rate, you again can apply this framework and experiment with different ads in order to identify the best. So what I described was like a classical vanilla multi on bandit. But in many cases, and then there's a, like a very important assumption in classical multi arm bandit. And that assumption tells you that different like arms that you're experimenting with, different actions are, are actually independent of each other. But in practice, this is not really the case. These arms could be uh, correlated with one another, and this assumption actually fails. The reason this assumption fails is usually because of some uh, inherent structure in the online underlying decision making processes. So if you think about healthcare, uh, there's a structure because we expect drugs that they have similar ingredients to have similar performance. So for revenue management, again, uh, there's a structure because we expect demands to go, um, to go down as prices goes up. And then in that case, if I'm learning something about one price, I can actually use that to learn something for other prices. And then for online advertising, uh, uh, there are some structure because, for example, if I have ads for Republican Party and like Democratic Party, so the performance of these two ads tend to be negatively correlated. If like the population reacting well uh, to like ads for, for example, Donald Trump, so we expect that they don't do well for, for the ad for like white. So then I think the punchline here is that in many settings, uh, if you want to apply this uh, class called multi arm bandits, uh, there exists some structural information that allows you to do better. It's not exactly obvious how to exploit the structural information, but definitely structural information makes arms correlated. And um, as I'm going to also tell you in the next slide, it allows you to do transfer learning. So if you learn something about one particular arm, you can actually learn something about some other arms that you are, uh, maybe you haven't even experimented with. Another important thing that maybe is crucial when you are like uh, when you are dealing with a structural information is that classical learning algorithm, Thompson sampling or UCB, they are going to perform poorly when you have a structural information. And if you don't know these algorithms, it's okay because I tell you that what these algorithms do at their core and why they are not really effective. So at the core of this algorithm, this algorithm stop playing an, an arm as soon as they figure out that arm is suboptimal. Okay, you may say, that seems like a good thing to do. If something is suboptimal, why do I want to keep playing that? It's not actually the right thing, may not be the right thing to do when you have a structural information. And that's the case if you uh, when you have a, like a suboptimal arm, and even if you know that it's suboptimal, and then let's say the suboptimal arm is correlated to a bunch of like arms that you haven't even experimented enough with. So in that case, playing suboptimal arm 
can help you with transfer learning. If they may allow you to learn a lot about other arms. And that's why in that case, when you have a structural information, following this like a Thompson sample and UCB may lead to a, like a, a bad performance. So no, hopefully I convince you a structural information exists and actually it's important to exploit them. The question is that how we are gonna exploit them and how we are gonna deal with the structural information. Yes, yeah, yeah, I, I, yeah, I think like massage. Yeah, yeah. So I think like you can try to kind of tailor as as I also ha have here. So you can try to given a structure, try to go back to this UCB or Thompson sampling, tailor it specifically to the ex uh, uh, this particular structure that you uh, you have in mind, and then design an algorithm that uh, just optimally exploit that particular structure. And people have done. Uh, have done, have taken this approach, as you said, like linear UCB is just an example. Yeah, but the linear UCB is only works for linear bandwidth. So you are not gonna be able to kind of use it for some other structure. Any other questions? Thank you, Shukla. Okay, so the approach we are taking in this work is completely different. So we are thinking, thinking about coming up with a unified, but very flexible framework that allows us to work for any convex structure band. So any question about the uh, motivation before I go to the model? Yes, yes. Is there some connection uh, with uh, information directed sampling? Yeah, so I think, uh, very good question. I, I think uh, I, I'll talk, so I, when I explain our, our model um, and our result, you will see that um, kind of our approach is completely different. It's kind of orthogonal to what they are doing. But uh, at the high level, they're also aware of the fact that you may want to play suboptimal arm, even if you know that arm is suboptimal, because by playing that, you get you gain some information. And uh, and then under this design, it's not obvious that you can always get the optimal regret. I'm gonna have a, like a remark about that. Uh, in a minute, okay. So now here is a model, which is a very simple model. I have a finite set of arms or action that uh, uh, that they have unknown reward distribution. So there's a decision maker who is gonna pull one of these uh, uh, arms at any run over the course of three runs. So reward of arm X in run T is gonna be R with probability PR of X, where this P is gonna be unknown to the decision maker to just to model the answer. Okay. Now there's an optimal arm X star that has the highest average reward. And as a decision maker, we would like to identify this optimal arm as soon as possible while balancing exploration and exploitation. And while we do that, we want to minimize uh, regret. We are going to suffer from uh, low, uh, low regret, where the regret for a policy pi would be the difference between the best reward in hindsight, which can be obtained, but keep playing the optimal R, minus the total obtained reward. And you can write this reward in according to this summation. And I want you to remember this summation because it will like show up in some part of the talk. So here uh, I, I can sum over all the arms x, as you can see here. And then I have NT of X, which is the number of times I actually like play this arm over T runs. And then this delta X of P is gonna be the gap between expected reward of arm X and the optimal arm. So that's gonna be the regret. Uh, any question? Yes. Yeah, yeah. Okay, I'm a bit, yeah, it's sloppy here in terms of, yeah. It's, it's just the, uh, it's gonna be best expected reward in hindsight if you know the reward distribution, not the realization. So if you wanna define the regret with respect to realization, you are not gonna be able to get something. So now, um, that, what I described was just simply vanilla and uh, classic for multi embedding what happened to structural information. So we actually have a very flexible way of like defining a structural information. And to model that, I'm saying that the reward, assume that the reward distribution P belongs to some convex set, curly P, which is known to the decision maker. So to make it clear, here are like uh, examples that uh, I discussed at the beginning of the talk. So in the healthcare setting, we had this structure that tells us if I have two drugs, D1 and D2, that they are similar, I expect them to have similar performance. So then in that case, this curly P would be all the distribution Q, such that under this Q, the expected reward under drug D1 minus the expected reward under drug D2, their absolute value is less than equal some depth. So this is how I model this structural information using this convex set curly P for the healthcare. So for online advertising, if I have some ads that are negatively correlated, 
uh, I'm going to have this calligraphic P as the all set distribution, all the distribution Q, such that under this distribution, the expected reward under at XD, right, for uh, Democratic Party, plus the expected reward under the at XR is going to be less than equal delta. So that tells me that if one of these ads is doing well, I expect the other ad not to as well. So again, this is a convex set and it, it can fit into our frame. Did you get a better rounding up? Oh no, this is a, I think this is a power of a point if the issue. So this is like a bracket, a square bracket, and that's a, like absolute value. Yeah. Yeah, I have a, a question on previous page. So it's like, it's the, the recurrence of the same thing that you the actual regret or the pseudo regret defined here? What is the pseudo regret? Okay. Yes. Yeah, I think I need to like it here. So this would be the whole expectation. Yeah, yeah. Oh, it's pseudo regret. Yeah, it's pseudo regret. It's a pseudo regret. Thank you. Okay, so uh, okay, so uh, okay. Now I want to like make two remarks. So first of all, these are the just for example. But using this convex set uh, here in the P, I can actually model existing structure bandits in the literature, including linear, convex, Lipschitz, unimodal. I can like model all of this using this convex P. And then another thing which is important is that existing structure bandits only impose a structure on the mean of the reward, but uh, which I also did here, just as an example, I will impose a structure on, on the mean. But actually using this framework, we can impose a structure on the entire reward distribution. You can impose a structure on the second moment, third moment, or uh, whatever you want. So even on the entire distribution, and we have examples uh, uh, about this in the paper. So it's like more general and also uh, more flexible. Just to make sure I understand. So you still have the independence of function at first form, but then you have this constraint in the marginal distribution. Exactly, yeah. I think every time I'm getting a sample, it's gonna be drawn uh, independently from that distribution, but there is this kind of, uh, uh, this complex said that uh, it's additional information that allows me to transfer learning uh, these remarks. Okay. Uh, any question about the model? Is that the last slide for the model? So, so ads are not negatively equal. So here, because this uh, the expected reward under uh, at xd plus the expected reward under uh, at xr is less than equal to some constant. Let's say I put this delta to be like 0.2. So then I know that if one of them like getting already like high click to rate for me, I expect the other one not to do as well. This is just an example to illustrate. Mm -hmm. In the sense that you expect the reward of one form is larger than other form is so you have independent factors. Yes, that's what's kind of. So uh, it's kind of negative correlation in the interface. So, but these are just examples to, to explain that this complex set P can be like quite general and can capture various like, constraints or various. So given this like a very general setup, so what we did here is that we designed a uniform learning algorithm for a structure band. So we call the algorithm dual structure-based algorithm do so, uh, uh, that up and ensure that that algorithm opt uh, obtains optimal regret, regardless what, uh, uh, what uh, structural information it has. So and at the core, this algorithm mimics the dual counterpart of the regular lower bound in order to kind of incorporate and exploit the structural information. It is computationally efficient and it, uh, it solves this uh, a convex problem, a finite convex problem in a uh, logarithmic number of periods. And uh, I think the punchline is that uh, the algorithm is the, uh, is the first algorithm that is kind of universally optimal for a wide range of structural information and is also at the same time computationally tracked. So uh, let me also briefly talk about related work. So uh, as also Shipro asked, usually in the literature, uh, when it comes to structural information, people like try to focus on a particular uh, structure, like linear or like Lipschitz, the structural information in contextual bandit or revenue management. And sorry that I, I like there are a lot of like papers here. And sorry if I missed like some important papers in, in this slide. So uh, and then one, once you kind of fix the structure, then you would go ahead and try to exploit it optimally given the, the setting you have. And it's possible to even like uh, massage or like kind of uh, try to rethink about UCB and Thompson sampling to, in order to design better algorithms. Um, but there are also like a few papers in the literature that they try to take unified approach. One is like uh, Compass et al. 2017 that their algorithm is also trying to mimic the regular lower bound. 
but they need to solve a semi-infinite optimization problem in every run. So, and because solving semi-infinite optimization problem is quite challenging, they could only handle a few, like a, a very specific set of like a structure bandies for which solving this semi-infinite optimization problem is doable. And also because of the same, uh, same reason, uh, they can only impose a structure on the mean reward of the arms rather than on the entire distribution. And uh, as another thing is that, uh, as I said, they need to solve this optimization in every run. But uh, as you are going to see uh, when I'm designing, uh, when I'm presenting the algorithm, we only need to solve it in logarithmic number of days. So this one is also related to the question that Yash asked. So there's this paper by uh, Dan Rasu and Ben Van Roy that they also look at a structure, a structure bandit. And at the high level, they, when it comes to choosing an arm, they try to balance reward gain uh, with like information gain. It's a completely different design idea. And it's not obvious that if I give them like a specific structure and information, if they can manage to uh, exactly obtain the uh, optimal. Yeah, that's also a probation setting, which is different. No, I think this is the part that maybe like putting all these things aside. So now I can uh, talk about the, the results of the paper. So. The question we ask ourselves is that how we can actually design an algorithm that works for any structural uh, information. And this seems like an overarching goal. So the main idea was uh, mimicking something that kind of directly encapsulate all the structural information. So then in that case, I, if I manage to do that, I should not be really worried about uh, different structural information because the thing that I'm uh, already like mimicking encapsulate all the structural information. So then what is the thing that I'm going to mimic? I'm going to mimic information theoretic regular lower bound, where this information theoretic regular lower bound tells me that if you want to be uniformly good, regardless of what instance I give you, uh, you cannot do better than uh, your regret, uh, the asymptotic regret cannot be better than C of P times log T. So first of all, this is logarithmic, but there's a constant in front of this log T that is actually uh, coming from some optimization problem. So what is this C of P, uh, or this optimization? First of all, as an objective, we need to minimize regret. Think about eta uh, as the logarithmic rate at which I'm exploring. And this delta is just a gap that we define. So I'm minimizing regret in that case, that's good. There is a, a constraint that uh, is, we, we call it like sufficient exploration uh, constraint. And this condition encapsulate all the structural information. And that's why at the high level, mimicking this information regular lower bound is a good idea. But you may wonder how is actually this sufficient exploration condition encapsulate all the structural information. And actually that condition end up like being quite important for us in terms of designing the algorithm. So I'm gonna spend maybe a few minutes just talking about this sufficient exploration condition. And then after that, uh, talk about the idea. You're, you're referring to... This is like, uh, this. by the way, this is like this regular lower bound is not our result. So it's uh, like graves and lie. They, and they have that for the Markovi and uh, bandit setting. What we consider is a special case of what they have. Yeah, it's not Laurie Robin, it's uh, another case. Okay, so, so now in the regular lower bound, and when it comes to the sufficient exploration condition, we wanna see what this condition is. So this condition tells us that we need to make sure that we have done enough exploration so that we can distinguish true reward distribution from deceitful distributions. And this is a name that we came up with. I don't know if that's a uh, right name, but you may wonder what are those deceitful distributions? So deceitful distributions are the one that can happen. They belong to this convex set and they have the same distribution at the optimal R but they deceivingly have a better R X prime to two. And then now you, you might say, why it is important to actually distinguish P from this deceitful set? Because it's essential to do that, because if you actually mistake this distribution from this deceitful distribution, you may wrongfully think that some other R X prime is the optimal R. And if that happened, you are gonna suffer linear regression. So that's why it's cru crucial to actually do enough exploration so that you can distinguish P from this deceitful distribution. So 
Mathematically speaking, what it means is that you want to make sure that there's some distance between P and this DC2 set, which I actually visualize it here. It is like green set, is greater than equal one. So what is this distance? It's some weighted scale uh, distance that I'm going to uh, talk about briefly later. That's not that important. And you may wonder why there's a one here. That's also related to this like optimal uh, hypothesis, test, which is since the, we are not actually coming up with the lower bounds, so I'm not going to bore with that. I just want to say that if you want to do enough exploration such that this distance between P and the seed full set is greater than the core. Uh, and now this distance actually depends on the structural information convex set P. And that's why then I go back to this like regular lower bound and replace that condition by this distance of P and the seed full set being greater than equal one. Now I can say that regular lower bound contains and uses all the uh, structural information. Yes. So are you going to have some, uh, I, I guess you'll have a non-degeneracy condition, right? Uh, meaning that there should be a unique best term for you to have this separation. Yeah, so there are like some mild uh, assumption including the uniqueness of the Oh, okay. So the way that curly P appears here is that because in definition of the deceitful R, this deceitful R should be being the convex set P, and that's why it's actually uh, replayable. Okay. Oh, sorry. Oh, you are going to you are going to see that is become like you you weigh you from the uh, you look at the KL distance but weighted KL distance where the weights are actually even. Okay. Thank you. Okay. So the decision mean like the simple instances. Uh, I give you like a what do you mean simple instances? So there is a, let's say there is a. Um, in a sense, they can be on the distribution. Yeah, so given a P, so if you fix P, like the, which is an instance for respond to this like bandit setting, so there are like a bunch of R and a bunch of reward distribution, and you should be very careful about that. You need to make sure that you have done enough exploration so that uh, you can separate P from the distribution. Yeah, it's an instance uh, specific, even uh, because uh, as you can see, it's also a function of P. Very well. So P is the P is the you can think about P and scary P. Uh, yeah. uh, so then uh, this is the regular lower bound, and now the lower bound contains and uses all the structural information. And let's go back to our overall idea because we wanted to take advantage of structural information by mimicking regular lower. Bound. So that was the main idea. But let's see what I, it actually means. Suppose that I solve this regular lower bound and I get the optimal solution denoted by eta of P. Then when I want to mimic regular lower bound, I'm going to pull suboptimal arm X this many times, eta X of P times log. It's kind of the rough idea of making sure that some every suboptimal arm X is being pulled a, a, a large number of times so that I can actually distinguish P and the seed food. But there is a very big issue. I don't even know the regular lower bound. The regular lower bound is a function of instance as also uh, she, pro, uh, uh, she pro mentioned. So then, the regular lower bound is not available because the true reward distribution is not available. If I had the reward true reward distribution, the problem would be very simple. I would just keep playing optimal. So uh, the high level idea is that we are going to compute empirical regret, empirical reward distribution PT and compute empirical regular lower bound C of PT. And then instead of following C of P, which I don't have, I'm going to uh, actually follow C of PT, empirical regular lower bound. This is kind of the high level. And if we show that PT is going to converge to P, so then uh, the empirical regular lower bound C of PT is also going to converge to C of P. Of course, this is an optimization problem, and it took us like a, um, a lot of like time and effort to actually show that this is continuous, so you do have that. But this is high level idea. If PT converges to P, uh, this empirical regret lower bound is going to converge to the actual regret lower bound and overall this mimicking idea is going to work. Any question? Something like that. But then uh, when you have a structural information, because uh, it could be actually different. So maybe some arms you don't even need to explore them. Uh, 
But for some ones, you need to explore them more or uh, less. So, yeah, that, that's so uh, now, uh, now it, it turns out that this, okay, we had this overall idea, but it turns out this following this idea on immediately the lower bound tends to be like quite challenging. And in, in particular, we face these three challenges that I listed here. So the first challenge is solving the lower bound is computationally expensive. So I need to make it like more tractable. Okay, so that was the first challenge. So let's see how I actually manage the first challenge. But I, I, I will go over each of the challenges one, one by one. And I tell you how I solve this, and then later I'm going to put everything together and present that. Okay. So let me first convince you that why solving regular lower bound is a challenging, uh, computationally challenging. So if you remember, that was a regular lower bound. We wanted to minimize regret, and then we wanted the distance between P and this deceitful set being greater than equal one. And maybe that goes back to your earlier question about the distance function. No, actually, this distance, which is weighted by uh, eta, is another optimization problem. I need to minimize over all the deceitful distribution. And here I have the weighted KL distance between true reward distribution and uh, all the um, distribution that are deceitful. So meaning that I have another optimization within another optimization. And in particular, I, I, I need to satisfy infinite number of constraints. For every Q which is deceitful, I need to satisfy that. So that's why solving this is not really um, the right, uh, right thing to do. So what we did is that we dualize this distance function. And when you dualize this distance function, you convert it to max, and that does give you this dual function. And um, then, then things become easy. So um, you only need to optimize over eta, which is the exploration rate and this mu uh, dual variables. But now this like dual counterpart is finite, it's convex, it can be solved. Again. And for those of you who know robust optimization, that's a trick that is being used a lot over there in robust optimization. So uh, uh, when you have like some infinite optimization problem, using this like a, uh, this technique by uh, doing this dualization, it would convert it nicely to its full. So, uh, is there is there some condition under which the dual problem is I'm just trying to get some intuition for what are the dual variables. Oh, yeah. It depends on the actually uh, the convex cone associated with the structural information. And uh, so um, in the paper, we have like several examples uh, that show that such a problem that we commented on the computational aspect of uh, this like, dual problem, uh, including uh, the existing structure bandits, uh, linear convex, Lipschitz, unimodal, and also some other like bandit, uh, uh, structure bandit that we came up with, in which we are imposing a structure on the everybody. Uh, yes. Yeah, I was just wondering, do you have any sort of like regularity assumptions on the like faster piece such that it's always finite or could also be infinite? Uh, any assumption that I put so that this uh, weighted scale divergence would be fine? Like, for instance, if Q is going like very, very small, that P is slightly off, PT is slightly So we wanted, like, there, as I said, there's, there's some mild assumption. For example, we need the curly P to have like volume. So that then you don't have that that problem. You also like needed the curly uh, under this uh, body, under the true reward distribution. We want the, the optimal one to be unique. So these are some more assumptions that allows us to make sure. First of all, this infimum can you replace it with the minimum? It can be attained. And uh, yeah, but then I think that these are, uh, these are we made all this assumption for this uh, technical purposes. Yes. I should have asked this question earlier, uh, but what is eta of x? Oh, eta of x is the logarithmic rate at which you are doing exploration. So if you remember that the lower bound was c of p times log t. So this is like kind of eta of x is going to be the logarithmic rate, which is uh, with which you need to do exploration for some sub x. So think about, let's say, eta, for example, is like two, just give a number. So that means that in like uh, over time, you need to explore this on two times locked, uh, locked. But it's eta that like, usually depends on the like, Yeah, because you're optimizing over that, yeah. right? So it definitely depends on. I just need yeah, to okay. explain yeah. so the logarithm. Just like in multi multi-arm band, it's one over delta x squared. Oh, delta x squared. Delta x squared. Delta x squared. So if you don't have a structural information, it would be one over delta square, which just depends on the instance. Yes. 
just to follow up on Yash's question, is there some simple example where the doer is not going to be strong? Uh, you are not being small. It's fine. Yeah. Okay. So, so that was the first challenge. We look at the uh, dual counter part of the bigger lower one, and that actually takes care of. Then, in that case, I don't need to really solve a semi-infinite optimization problem. So then, the, there was a second challenge that. We don't really want to solve the regret lower bound, even if it is convex in every round. So the question is that how can I remove the necessity of solving the regret lower bound in every in every round? So for that one, we said, okay, if I don't want to solve the regret lower bound, I want to make sure that I have collected enough information that allows me to distinguish P of T from this deceitful set. Okay. As long as this is satisfied. So I would say, okay, I'm okay. I don't really need to update my decision and just resolve the regular lower bound. But it turns out that if you want to kind of use that as a test, if you remember that was an optimization problem over this uh, deceitful distribution, this test can be quite demanding. It's another like a uh, convex problem. So I don't want to replace one optimization with another one. So what we did is that we designed a very simple one dimensional test uh, that in that test, instead of looking at the distance between PT and this deceitful set, which could have like a weird shape. So we are looking at the distance between PT and a hyperplane H that contains this deceitful set. And the way we come, come up with that is based on like a duality theory. Uh, uh, and then we actually show that if this is greater than equal one, using the duality theorem, you can show that this is also gonna be greater than equal one. So meaning that this is a more conservative test but it's, it's still like helpful because you only, you, you can like, uh, when you want to test that, you need to only solve one dimensional uh, convex optimization problem, which is very easy to do. And later you are going to see that uh, how this like simple information test is allow us to remove the necessity of solving the regular lower bound in every single round. So that was the second challenge. And then now there's a third challenge that we want to make sure that PT actually converges to P. Because P, if PT does not converge to P, so the whole idea of mimicking is not going to work. So how can I make that happen? Perhaps you have guessed the answer. It's just exploration. We make sure that no arm is completely unexplored. And in particular, we look at the least plate arm. If the number of times that this least plate arm is, uh, uh, is less than some uh, threshold, epsilon times SD, where SD is the number of, total number of exploration so far, uh, then I'm just gonna actually explore that arm. And by doing that, I make sure that there is no arm that is completely unexplored. And that would allow me to kind of make sure that PT converges to P, empirical reward distribution converges to actual reward distribution. Oh, do you have a question? Okay, so there were like, uh, we faced these three main challenges and there were the solution. Let me put everything together to uh, show you the final algorithm. So at the beginning, we first like uh, check if you have collected enough information. And in particular, we run this like one dimensional information test by, so by looking at the distance between PT and hyperplane. If that distance is greater than equal one, we say, okay, it seems like we have collected enough information. I don't really need to do anything. Let me just go and explore. It. And I'm gonna explore it by playing the best arm given PT. Okay. If the distance ends up being less than one, that's the part that we are going to say, okay, we need to do some exploration. And the first thing we do, we say, okay, let me first see if the least play R is actually being covered, it's explored enough. If, if that wasn't the case, then I'm just going to pull the least play R. If I find an arm that is not really, the, the, if the least play arm is good, so then I'm just going to solve the regular, uh, dual regular lower bound to obtain a target rate eta x at pt. And then I'm just gonna pull the most R, uh, the most behind R by looking at this ratio, the number of times that R played divided by the rate which is coming from the regular lower. So now, uh, how did I use the structural information? Uh, as you could have guessed, I actually used it here. I, I followed the dual regular lower bound and this dual regular lower bound contains all the structural information and that's how I use the structural information. You will see that because of this um, information test here, I don't do exploration. I don't even, I don't enter this loop uh, very often. And I have a like theoretical result for that, which I'm gonna show you. 
So then that with the, with the help of this information test, I removed the necessity of uh, uh, solving the regular lower bound in every round. And, um, and then I do this exploration to make sure that PT converges to P. And that's the, that's the overall algorithm. Any question? Now, uh, then under some mild assumptions, some of, of these assumptions I already like mentioned, uh, meaning that this calligraphic P should be like have a volume and uh, X should be unique. So for any accuracy parameter epsilon, uh, do so has the following two properties. So first it's obtained asymptotic regret. If you look at the regret divided by log T is less than equal one plus epsilon C of P plus O of epsilon. So I can take epsilon to go to zero. I cannot make it exactly zero because if I do make it zero, that means that no exploration. I cannot really do that. But I can like take it to zero. And if, that, if I do that, I can recover C of P times log T, which was exactly the regular lower bound. And another thing which is important is this log and the number of times I, I enter this exploration phase is, is actually O of log T. Remember, during the exploration phase is the, it was the part that I, me, I may end up like solving the regular lower one. Now I know that the expected number of times that I'm actually entering exploration round, and as a result, I may actually solve the regular lower one. It's going to be log t, and uh, as I said, and that's because of our information test. Because of the information test, I remove the necessity of solving the regular lower one in every. The contract is mid regards for on ice and between. Yeah, I know that you have that. And you have that for all the I think it depends on the bonds, right? It depends on the like the lower one and upper bond that you have. Sometimes maybe this bond could be uh, kind of informative, meaning that maybe you get uh, something better than one over delta uh, squared when you solve the eta. But um, you want to like you want perhaps the answer you you, are, you want from me is that maybe the close form solution for such a study. I don't have that, but we try like such a like a structure band in your numerical studies, and this uh, we are able to handle that. I was thinking if I tell you that the mid regard is bound by 10, then you expect the regret to extend the 10 to reject like C of P to the 10, the like maximum length of edges in this box. Mm -hmm. Honestly, I don't have the answer to that question, but that's something I need to see. Yes, I'm thinking is, for example, if I give you a constraint, the sum of the mean regards is given constraint. I think we did not really explore that question yeah. because we said, okay, regular lower one has been like obtained the literature. We are trying to just meet that towards that, towards that. But then it's interesting to figure to actually take a closer look at the regular lower one and for the specific instances to see more. So you want the actual mean bounds? That's what you. We can check off when I have done some work in that space. Okay, so now I think maybe one page proof. Uh, I like here when I'm presenting this proof a sketch, I'm just hiding a lot of details because. The continuity of the regular lower bound was the, one of the challenges we faced. I'm not going to comment on that, but just say that we, uh, when we wanted to bond regret, we the, decompose it into the regret during exploration and regret during exploitation. So during exploitation, we get a finite regret, and that's because of our information test. So every time the test passes, it seemed like we were good, so we get like finite regret. During exploration, uh, that's the part that we are getting the maximum amount of regret in, in our bond. And, um, and we get like one plus epsilon C of P times log T. So we divide it into two cases. Uh, what if, if the PT is not close to P? We show that regret in that case is actually finite because with high probability you are good. But then when PT is close to P, using our continuity argument, I know eta of PT is gonna be close to eta of P, which is the optimal solution to the empirical regret lower one is gonna be close to the optimal solution to actual regret lower one. And then you can write regret in terms of Delta X of P, uh, and since we are mimicking regret lower bound, you are gonna kind of uh, 
play Rmx by like eta time, eta, eta of pt times log t. And I know that eta of pt is close to eta. So then you can replace that with like eta times one plus epsilon. And that's why the, the C of p would act. I guess the kind of some idea that where this really lower one is going to play a role in the, in, in the proof. Okay, so um, any questions so far? Yes. Uh, <clears throat> do you have any regret bounds for finite time? I'll say again. Oh, the, oh, yeah, okay. So this is asymptotic regret bound that I presented. So in the paper, we also have the uh, kind of uh, regret for the finite T as well. But it, it was like very messy, so I wouldn't be able to actually. But we, we do have it in the paper, yes. I'm wondering what is the dependence on the number of bounds, the regret bounds? Yeah, I think the, the dependence on the, uh, on the number of arms is not really uh, graceful. So it's, uh, and then I think that this is because of the generality of the setting, uh, because uh, when it comes to using the, the concentration and the quality, uh, uh, the bond we got like for like, uh, the, the bond we used was like a very loose bond. And that would lead us to uh, quite like when, when you look at the dependence of the regret bound and the number of bonds, that was not really, uh, was exponential. But uh, I think this is because of the analysis not being time. Because in the simulation, when we tried uh, different number of arms, like 20, 30, 50, we did not really see any uh, kind of uh, bad performance in that would have maintain this good performance as we expected. We really think that the analysis in that sense is not good. But that's it. And then the process the number of arms also part of the potential picture. I mean, the number of arms should be somehow. Yeah, so uh, you may have a, like, a structure only like on two arms or like on the old arms. So I did not really. So I guess my question is if you say my reader bound is uh, D times C of B times log T, then how do we know that this is actually matching the information to the lower bound? Well, this is, this is asymptotic, right? So everything I'm getting so as. I think there are like some terms here. So I did not really hide anything with respect to T here. So everything no, is respect to D, so there are, like the number of arms. Okay, so let's say there was a, like a term that depends on like number of arms. Then we divide the block T and take block T uh, to take T to infinity, that term without the sum. Okay, so here when I'm showing like there's nothing that depends on like number of arms in that term. So there are like some terms that where it like depends on the number of arms, but those like when you take t goes to infinity, then they will go to zero. So, so the actual regret term that they have is multiplied by a little of like exactly. Yeah. So then it should be zero. Oh, so we did some numerical studies to just understand how this algorithm compares to the uh, algorithm that are really tailored for a specific structure band is including linear and leaf shifts. So um so then here what I'm showing you is the normalized cumulative, cumulative regret when I do normalization by the regret lower one. So I want the, ideally I want this number to be close to one if I want to match the regret lower one. So what we observe is that Dusa's regret is quite comparable to the regret of algorithms that are specifically tailored for this uh, type of bandit linear and lip sheets. And another thing which was quite surprising and nice was that if you look at this box plot, you will see Dusa's regret is very concentrated around its mean. But for algorithm like GLM UCB, so there are a lot of like outliers. So for example, there's an outlier whose regret is in the order of 35 times regret lower bound. So here we only have like 200 instances. So if you increase the number of instances, for example, to 2000, you would see even like worse outlier. My point is that the regret for these algorithms for some reason end up like being heavy tail. And, uh, and, but for DUSA, it seems like it's more concentrated around, uh, around this. So, we also wanted to kind of show that DUSA can go beyond this existing structure bandit. So we come up with a, a notion of bandits, we, like we call it divergence bandit that imposes structure on the first and second moment of the, uh, of the reward distribution. The details is not important, but then I just wanna, we wanted just to show that we can go beyond me. So, and then here I'm showing the cumulative regret versus time. And I'm showing you the regret of DUSA, which is the ping pong with the regret of uh, vanilla UCB, where the UCB does not even consider the structural information. So first we observe that uh, it's really crucial to take advantage of a structural information. There's a big gap between a DUSA and uh, vanilla UCB. So that's the first message. Another thing that we wanted to see is that there are some rare instances in which the regular one is actually zero. 
if it has go back to your question having a closed form. So there are actually uh, some cases that regal lower bound is zero, and that happens if the set of the seed pool distribution is empty. Yeah, I mean, I give you an interval such that you can identify. Yeah, the yeah, exactly. So now the question is that can this algorithm, which is a very general, pick on that? Can, and then so we identify a bunch of like instances, and then you see for these instances based on this like a dotted thing. Uh, so do some managers to get like a um, constant regret. It's regret even does not scales with T, which was expected. But then UCB keep like exploring because it does not use the uh, the, the structure at all. And um, yeah, so I, like we wanted to see these all corner cases can be also handled. And we also have a, like a theoretical result for that. Any question about the simulation? You're doing empirical, you have to do thumbs. Huh? Did you not do thumbs? Yeah, you're doing empirical study. Oh, okay. So you say that it wasn't yeah, fair to yeah. compare. Especially if you're doing KLS, I mean, that's like same theoretical guarantee. Yeah, I don't know. For some reason, we did not do thumbs. <laughs> but that's, I mean, but I, 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 must, I would not be surprised to see that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't know what you see, yeah. but I'm just yeah. saying. Yeah, maybe it's right. <laughs> Okay. So uh, let me conclude. So uh, in this point, we look at the uh, structure bandit, and then we provide a uniform uh, framework and algorithm that to study a structure bandit. So we present an algorithm that uh, we call it DUSA. DUSA mimics the regular lower bound and uh, try to actually solve the dual counterpart of the regular lower bound in only logarithmic number of times. And by doing that, we show that uh, uh, first of all, DUSA gets optimal regret. Uh, also, the number of times it needs to solve this optimization problem is uh, logarithmic in a uh, number of periods. So then DUSA is the first universally optimal algorithm that is computationally interactive. So there's another thing I want to actually, at the end of the talk, I want to mention. And um, I really, so in, in my view, you have like a bunch of like design idea. So there's this UCB idea, there's Thompson sampling idea. I believe that like what we did here, it can be viewed as a, Kind of very flexible way and new design to actually handle uh, band this problem, and uh, it's kind of when you try to incorporate optimization into like uh, online decision making, because in this really lower one that we try to mimic, it also can incorporate like different also uh, structure or consideration that you might have. For example, one of my um, colleagues at MIT, we work with uh, with his former student Jackie. Actually, took this framework as a follow up work, and they try to incorporate fairness consideration when it comes to the exploration. And they show that the kind of like similar mimicking idea is gonna work out here. So just I wanna, I really hope that more people start kind of seeing value in this type of design, because to me it's really flexible. If you have, if you have like a constraint or consideration, you can kind of plug it into a regular lower bound. And by mimicking that, you kind of, uh, in a very implicit way, you would incorporate that into your design. So that's the final thing. Thank you so much for uh, listening to my talk and for uh, for the great question. And I would take any question, other question you might have. Thank you. Yes. Um, if, if we didn't care about computation, could we take P to be non-convex as well, or is there some other? Yeah, I think P is not convex. Uh, overall, the same idea would go through, but I don't know what to solve the regular uh, one. But if the computation uh, is not the computational issues is not a it is not a constant that someone can actually uh, use similar ideas for other structure. Thanks for so so sort of by lot of structure but the number of arms might be more than the horizon like so whatever right so yeah. you think I mean I think you had a condition where you wanted to sample each arm at least once. Yeah. So uh, what are your thoughts on settings where you have too many arms? So we have like too many arms to... Yeah, so let me think about it. So as long as you can actually, like for the regular lower one, you can formulate it in a kind of a maybe concise way that can be handled, perhaps that's doable. But I don't know how to get rid of this initialization at the beginning that we have. Uh, but maybe like you can also remove that and then kind of... Uh, if there are like some existing structure, maybe you don't need to actually play with each of the R, and maybe you can actually sample some of them at the beginning because they're already some structure. But I'm just thinking all about I have another point. Thank you. Thank you.